the mind has been defined as that part of consciousness which feels, per perceives, wills, and thinks. Now this definition sounds rather impressive, but it actually says nothing. Because it describes for us an unknown instrument producing consequences each of these words which we have used representing a mystery which has not been solved. We may assume that the mind thinks, but what is thought? We may assume that the mind wills, but what is will? Actually, we have created a series of words to describe effects arising in some part of man's equipment. These effects become the means by which we shall define their own cause. Therefore, we explore the mind simply in the terms of that which we attribute to the mind, and the subject itself remains even today, very largely mysterious. Yet whether we can define the term or not, we use the mind every instant of our conscious existence. We have come to regard it as so intimate a part of our own economy that we do not any longer question its processes. We do not very sincerely analyze the power of thought in ourselves, and we are duly impressed by the tremendous consequence, collectively speaking, of mental function. One way, perhaps, to get some comprehension of what mind accomplishes is to settle down to a thoughtful analysis of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Here we have summarized into very brief statements whole processes of human activity, a science which may require years for a man uh, to advance to a workable degree is represented in the encyclopedia by a paragraph or perhaps a page at the most. And so these thousands and thousands of pages are devoted to the infinite variety of experience arising from the mind. We find summaries of sciences, of arts, and of crafts. We find the pageantries of history unfolded, with names inserted here and there, names which we could give much attention to and write great books about one single name. When we consider, for example, the brief article on Abraham Lincoln, brief in the sense that perhaps three or four pages are devoted to him, and then recognize the thousands of books that have been written to amplify the brief and factual statements in the encyclopedia. Another book that uh, gives us some comprehension of mental process is the Unabridged Dictionary. Here we find what man's mind has done with the world of words. We find the building up of the most intricate word patterns and forms, all devised to release to our common knowledge some attribute, power, conclusion, or attitude of the mind. We look around us and we observe that everywhere mind is in action. Especially, of course, we conceive this in the world of our own kind, where our type of mind or the peculiar mentation of our species forever bewilders us. The small boy in school, when asked who invented electricity, replied, uh, Thomas Edison. 
He thought he was rather close to the facts, but actually Edison did not invent electricity. What we call invention is very largely the mind discovering, the mind estimating and weighing the operations of natural law or phenomena. And from these observations arising in itself, coming in the end to various conclusions, some of which lead to new and useful improvements in our various methods of operating our lives. Mind is really an almost incredible thing. Almost every process that we know rises only from our power to think. And yet we assume that we are born with this power, that we share in it as we do in all other natural resources, and that by some strange mystery, each person is endowed with a mind capable of governing his conduct and establishing him in one of the important paths of success with which most persons are concerned. In schools today, we are having quite a problem in connection with the mind. Up to only, say, a hundred years ago, education was a comparatively simple process. Uh, this does not mean uh, that the older peoples were necessarily better educated, but it meant that it means that they did not have to consider so many aspects and phases of the mental life of the human race. Within the last century, there has been a mental explosion. Thought has been directed to innumerable channels previously unconsidered. And today, it takes longer to, ma to uh, understand or master a single science that once was required uh, to become aware of practically all human thought. So the mind goes on its way. We do not know how far we have actually penetrated into mental substance or into mental process. We assume, probably rightly, that this process can unfold indefinitely that there is really no limit upon the power of mind except such limit as uh, is represented by the laws governing its development. Therefore, we have learned that, for example, the mind requires certain foundations before it can proceed to further considerations. We must advance to a measure or a certain point before the next advancement is possible. We cannot leap from complete ignorance to complete wisdom, but must gradually unfold step by step not only the processes of thought, but the consequence of these processes applied to the social activities of the species. But we live with this amazing instrument. Uh, we consider it so essentially uh, identical with ourselves that we really credit ourselves with every discovery that mind makes. And the only way we have of labeling process is to associate persons with mind. Therefore, we think of a certain type of mind, and we say that Plato possessed that kind of mind. We regard him as one of the world's great philosophers. But if we separated Plato as a body or an instrument from his own intellect, very little would remain that is important. Plato was mind moving. Aristotle, the same. The rise of the Christian church was mind moving. The rise of science, a further expression of this same movement. All of these things that men have done are suspended from this one mysterious instrument by which it seems man is capable of a rational process. Checking in the current edition of the ordinary collegiate dictionary which will be used by our young intellectuals while battling with the curriculum, uh, we find that the first definition now associated with mind is memory or recollection. Uh, the power to bring into focus 
various areas of thought which have been previously acquired or attained. Thus one of the most important processes of mind is coordination of thought, the bringing together of related matter, the contrasting of one process with another, and the continuous effort to coordinate or to bring these processes into a common focus. In order that we should advance any field of mental activity, therefore, we have to have call, we have to have recourse to reminiscence or recollection. By means of this, uh, we create the foundations upon which further thought can be built. Uh, one way in which we attempt to strengthen memory or recollection is by an artificial means. This means we call education. For education is that process whereby the individual is able to attain certain useful recollections without being forced to experience each item which he must learn to use later. It is quite impossible for the average human being to relive his race or relive the cultures that have preceded him. Yet these previous cultures represented levels or platforms of mind upon which new progress must be made. Therefore, the wisdom of his race, the heritage of knowledge already attained, is given to him through the educational procedure. Thus, in a few years, he sort of catches up, finds his own orientation, and discovers the platform upon which his own culture stands. Education is consequently making available to the mind of contemporary man the works of the minds of previous men, thus going on and on from one generation to another into the unknown future which lies ahead. Sometimes we are amazed by the works of the mind. Sometimes uh, we feel the deepest veneration for this mysterious instrument, and again, we feel the deepest fear or doubt as to the consequences of our own mental processes. We have learned to recognize that in certain ways at least the mind is not a civilized thing. It is a process. It seems to be almost a mechanical process. For in this problem of thinking uh, we do not always respond to the maturing influences of moral or ethical value. This is particularly true, perhaps, in the thought of modern science, which has done everything possible to divorce the mind from the restraining influence of moral condition. The idea or attitude being that it is the right of mind to think, and that the mental process demands that the mind be liberated from all real or imaginary restraints, in order that may go on penetrating, probing, investigating, for the fulfillment of its own mental purposes. This was considered a rather admirable state of affairs until the, the rise of science. Now it is obvious that many of these mental processes can lead to dangerous consequences. The mind, therefore, seemingly is in need of some kind of leadership other than that which it imposes upon its own nature. It does not mean, however, that mind, with its recollecting power, might not ultimately arrive at its own morality, for out of the vast pageantries of experience it is quite conceivable that the mind would finally come to the recollection and realization of the importance of positive standards of conduct and high moral and ethical procedure. In the meantime, however, we are still confronted with this thing we call the mind, and it would be optimistic indeed to attempt that which the ages have not been able to attain, namely an accurate definition of the total mental process. In the last 25 years, psychology has probed very deeply into the observable or tangible powers of mind. It has attempted to take all previous knowledge relating to the mental activity of man and from the coordination and contemplation of this knowledge 
and through further research along technical and scientific lines uh, to create some at least symbolic design of the mind itself attempting to discover its anatomy its physiology and its psychology to a degree some success has been attained but here again there are elements and processes which are not as yet uh, known and for which no uh, methods have yet been devised I think therefore that in the uh, large pattern of things man has gradually created a concept of mind this concept of mind we sort of pass on as a tradition uh, we assume that it is enough and we uh, uh, give it to our children with the firm belief that with this equipment they will be able to sustain the constant tensions of the mind and uh, advance its various causes one thing we have all come to observe of course is that the mind operating in different persons operates differently uh, we are not of one mind in any common fact we are not of one mind in politics or in religion or even in science though perhaps more continuity and consistency has have been developed on the scientific level we are not of one mind in our opinions in our moralities in our devotions or our dedications and mostly we are not of one mind in the daily administration of our affairs as a result uh, we divide into schools of thought into types of mind and we gradually attempt to classify these types we recognize the simple processes of primitive mind we recognize the more advanced processes of the highly trained sophisticated mind of modern man knowing that we do not think alike on most subjects and as we investigate systems of philosophy for example we recognize the infinite diversity of conclusions that the mind can reach about even a single subject it must therefore seem at least to us that this mind is individual perhaps even personal it is hard for us to assume that if we had one mind in common that we have so few thoughts in common this is not strictly demonstrable but it is certainly a definite tendency there certainly is a difference of opinion today between East Germany and West Germany uh, in many instances these differences may be quite sincere and may be supported by comparatively logical argument but the agreement is lacking there is very little common ground between the great religions of the world today even though their ideals and concepts and precepts are extremely similar there is very little common mind in modern politics for no man goes to office but that he is immediately supported by some and assailed by others there is very little agreement in our own thinking as to what constitutes the most desirable home uh, the best state for our children or the best way uh, to manage a business each has his own feelings about these things and while statistics are available which would help to organize some common patterns the majority of persons are not inclined to be statistical in these matters they still do much as they feel they wish to do and use every possible means to defend their own opinions thus mind seems to be capable of an infinite individualization and uh, psychology seeking to understand this has come up with one rather interesting and profitable thought namely that this individualization arises from conditions by means of which the mind is brought into a certain pattern of experiences these experiences are remembered they become both consciously and subconsciously part of our lives and most of our thoughts and decisions arise from these patterns so that we are not thinking simply with the mind but thinking with a mind conditioned by various things that have happened to us 
by the background from which we have come, from our racial structures and from our religious uh, theories and opinions. Thus psychology is inclined to suspect that there might be a more universal kind of mind than we have been inclined to imagine, but that this universal kind of mind takes on certain shapes and colorings according to the instruments through which it passes. There is undoubtedly certain mental activity in animals. There is a type of mental activity in nature around us, but it is conditioned by the structures through which it expresses itself. Therefore, we must say that a mind inhabiting a body must always be a conditioned mind. A mind inhabiting a time must be a conditioned mind, or a place, or in some relationship to space, or to the larger dimensions of human recognition. Consequently, mind in its operation operates within a pattern of contemporary events. It is deeply moved by the pressures of immediate conditions. And as we go back again to our encyclopedia and begin to study the various personalities who have changed the course of history for better or for worse, we realize that each of these persons was a highly conditioned individual. He was conditioned by his own background, by the things that happened to him. Napoleon was conditioned by his height, the Duke of Wellington by his stomach. Almost everyone is conditioned by something. Others are conditioned by the lands in which they live. The Asiatic mind is influenced by Asiatic climate. Those inhabiting large nations are conditioned by the size of their countries. Those inhabiting small areas by the limitations that these areas and restrictions bestow. Most persons are conditioned by language. A great many are conditioned uh, by the temperature of their climates those inhabiting temperate zones having certain advantages. Everywhere mind moving into manifestation is conditioned. And by this conditioning we have the saint and we have the dictator. We have the humanitarian and we have uh, the uh, rogue, the desperado. Every one of these types results from some conditioning. Adolf Hitler is a product of conditioning. So undoubtedly is robust old Mr. Khrushchev, who no doubt in the world has a background which gives him a peculiar fondness for pounding podiums with shoes. These things are not simply accidents. They arise from something. And if we understood Mr. Khrushchev, we would know exactly why he acts the way he does. Why mind moving in him is quite different in its expression from mind moving through some idealist like Jane Addams of Hull House or mind moving in the strange, dark, but wonderfully luminous world of Helen Keller. All of these expressions are mind conditioned by restraints, by intensities, and by processes, most of them probably made available in conscious action by memory, by the various recollections and reminiscences with which our lives have been enriched or impoverished. Uh, even science today, while it thinks slowly in these matters, having its mind preoccupied with other concerns, is inclined to suspect that mind, as it expresses in man, must be in some way related to the total process of the universe. Fifty years ago, it was assumed that man, by an evolutionary process, was the only intelligent creature in nature. This could be defended in the sense that certainly man was the most shrewd and cunning of all creatures. Uh, that man by this allotment was superior 
was again a question that has never been fully solved, although we assume that that which possesses superior mental attributes or powers is of an advanced type. Gradually, however, our opinion about mind has changed. We are no longer able to assume that man is a mindful creature existing, existing in a mindless duration of time and space. The principal function of mind, as we explore it today in our own lives, is to bring order out of chaos in some way. This order may not always be constructive or purposeful, but there is this constant progress in organization, this building up of patterns uh, by means of which we arrive at certain total pictures. In the universe around us, there is evidence of the operation of mind, although we have not been able to pinpoint uh, the exact location of the mental agent or its relationship to other things. We say that if man thinks, he becomes a law-abiding citizen. We live in a law-abiding universe. How did it arrive at its ethics? We live in a world of cause and effect. And one of the most important processes of thought is the sequence of cause and effect. We live in a universe uh, which is apparently moral to the extent that it produces certain, certain inevitable rewards and punishments for conduct, not only for man's conduct, but for natural conduct. We live in a world also of uh, what science might term exactitudes. The processes of, of universal existence are orderly, consistent, and reasonable. Therefore, we have to assume that the reasonable can exist apart from reason, or else we must assume that the reasonable is dependent upon reason. Some would like to assume, of course, that the reasonable produces reason, but this is a more or less uh, backward approach to the subject, for it is difficult to assume that an effect without a cause can in turn become a cause. Therefore, we are inclined to suspect today that somewhere in the very structure and substance of nature, of the universe, or of the world, there must reside that principle upon which all mentation depends, that in some way man partakes of a power everywhere present, and that the very fact that man thinks proves that an archetypal thought exists that there has to be in nature the possibility of thought. There has to be in the universe uh, those materials and substances by which mind can be engendered. And that this mental process in its own turn, distributed in various ways through all forms of creation, appears to man and in man in the form we recognize. Idealistic philosophy has long held this point, namely that there is in the universe a universal mind. That this universal mind has its same relationship to personal mind that universal life has to personal life. If the universe was not alive, nothing in it could be alive. If the universe was not life, life itself could not unfold and flourish around us. As surely, therefore, as all living things depend upon life, so surely all thinking things depend upon thought, depend upon some material or substance available. We may specialize that kind of substance into certain processes peculiar to our own needs, but we have no way of knowing with certainty that any other part of the universe is devoid of this mental agent. Not long ago, I built a little trellis in the backyard for a vine. Uh, this trellis was an open structure of slats, and the little vine started to grow up the trellis. Each step of the way, this little plant had to 
across the intervals between the slats. It had to grow across six or eight inches in order to achieve uh, its next brace or its next point of contact with something that would sustain it. In building the trellis, we made a kind of right angle out of it to meet a certain need. And when the little plant reached the angle, it promptly went around the corner and continued to find the nearest support. Now, how did this happen? How is it that this growing thing, which we think of more or less as developing in a straight vertical line, uh, sort of reaching up to a heaven which was hardly a very valuable support at this moment, how does it happen that this vine had the recognition to go around a corner? We can't assume that the vine had eyes that could see the corner. We cannot assume that this little vine sat down and contemplated upon the advisability of this action. We cannot say that it was influenced by its relatives. We cannot assume that its ingenuity was the result of higher education. But it did what was necessary and did so immediately. Therefore, it appears that there is some kind of directing intelligence by means of which every form of life fulfills its own proper purposes, impelled or compelled by some pressure within itself. We cannot possibly explain this twist or turn in the vine from the belief that it always heads to the sun because this was not in the right direction. We also know that ivy planted in a labyrinth has managed to follow all the mysterious and torturous passageways until finally it emerged to light. It therefore worked toward light, but in the deeper part of these passageways, this light was not visible at all. Therefore, something had to guide or lead this plant. We do not know what kind of mind it is, but there seems to be no error in it. This little ivy plant did not make any mistakes. Uh, when the same labyrinth of exactly the same type and, and style of complication was enlarged so that a human being could walk through it, it was found that the human being attempting to escape made numerous errors and only after a rather long and confusing experience was able to find his way out of the labyrinth. Yet the ivy made no mistake at all. So we are constantly confronted with evidence that there is some kind of process of judgment, of reason, or of common sense working around us in space, even as it works within us. Various terms have been created uh, to help us to understand the nature of this larger mind. We have to assume it. We have no more reason to doubt it than we have reason to doubt the function of our own minds. For while perhaps our functions may be more easily analyzed and remembered, certainly we know no more of their cause than we know of the cause of universal intelligence. A theology, of course, at an early time uh, accepted the most common, natural, and reasonable conclusion which primitive man uh, could arrive at. Uh, theology simply assumed that God had a mind, that God created and ruled the world with God's own mental power. Therefore, that the universe was the product of a rational procedure. That it was the result of a great universal divine thought. And that it was guarded, protected, and unfolded through all time uh, by the wisdom of this divine thought. Modern metaphysics has taken up uh, much of this type of thinking, and we have now a series of terms, cosmic mind, universal mind, divine mind. All of these are applicable to our concept of God 
as the leader of mental processes in existence. As we go a little further into this the problem, we find that the earlier religious peoples uh, began to recognize that there was a difference between divine mind and human mind. The divine mind seemed to have an omnipotence, an omniscience apart from the mind of man. So the worshiping and the devout came to the conclusion that the mind of God was always right and the mind of man was not always right. That the mind of God knew all things, the mind of man only certain things. And in an attempt to understand what was meant by a universal mind, the thinking human being could only extend his own concept of consciousness uh, to its extreme degree. Therefore, God knows in total that which all men know only in part. Uh, the great virtue of the divine mind was its completeness, was its all-knowing, was its sufficiency to everything necessary or valuable. God could, by the extension of the divine mind, examine the heart of every creature, determine merits and demerits, and properly, wisely, and lawfully assign rewards and punishments. Thus the divine mind began to take shape in the cognition of the human being. He knew it only through the experience of his own thinking. But it seemed to him absolutely necessary. He could not imagine that man was given a mind and the creator of all things was without one. It was impossible to him to assume that the mind of God was less than the mind of man nor could he follow that which was later to take the course of humanism, that there was no need for any mind in space, that man perhaps was fashioned or created to become the ultimate mind governing all things. Uh, such enthusiasm and audacity uh, were beyond the comprehension of our ancestors. Rather, man found it more valuable, more important to his own nature, to be rather humble and to assume that he lived within the presence and within the very substance of an ever guiding intelligence. As we went along the course of religious thinking, there has been a notable individualization of attitudes on these different subjects. Only a very short time ago, religious conformity was almost a physical law. Uh, all nonconformity was regarded with the greatest suspicion, and where possible, it was prevented, or if it arose, it was punished and exterminated. But now individual thinking has become the fashion of the time, and the person no longer feels that he has to accept certain attitudes or concepts without thought. As he thinks about these attitudes and concepts, his conclusions may differ from those of his ancestors. This is almost inevitable because he lives in a different world. He is under different processes and pressures. He is living under tensions which antiquity never knew. He is challenging boundaries and frontiers of space that have never before been challenged so far as our history records. So he has to use certain initiatives among these the right of mental exercise and freedom. Yet in this process of using his own mind, he is becoming aware that this process is not as easy as he thought, nor can he be sure that the mind which he possesses can censor the thoughts which it thinks. Gradually it has come to uh, our realization that there were many kinds of minds in man, uh, due perhaps to the various organizations of his structure, physical and psychological, and perhaps due to, again to heredity and environment. But in any case, man himself does not always think with one mind. When we me mention mental confusion, 
We, might, we mean patterns of ideas that conflict with each other. Nor is man necessarily consistent in his thinking. The thoughts at one moment are not his thoughts at another moment. And he very often lives a series of contradictions which deplete his reserves and throw him against himself in a conflict which may extend throughout his life. Thus the mind does not appear to be something that we can simply grasp and having taken hold of it achieve security. The mind itself does not always convey the very answers which we most definitely need. Yet somehow, somewhere in mental equipment, we sense the possibility of finding these answers and in making a more thorough survey of mental phenomena, we hope to arrive at the conclusions that are needed. In uh, the modern world, most persons are divided into idealists and realists. An idealist is simply a person primarily who believes that there is a pattern of value underlying life. The realist does not assume that such a pattern is unnecessary, but he assumes that it is unattained, and therefore that realism must accept this immaturity and hope that sometime the complete pattern will be attainable. Uh, philosophy gives us certain consolation in these matters and perhaps opens an avenue of thought which has been neglected, especially in the last several hundred years. If man is to solve the universe, if he is to find the answers to the essential questions of life, where is he to seek for these answers? It is pretty obvious that he's not going to find them by landing a capsule on the moon. It is also equally obvious that if he should reach another planet, he may find only another center of discord in space. It's not at all certain that any other planet has solved at least completely the problems with which we are perturbed. The very isolation of planet creates a sense of environmental uh, separation. Beings on little globes floating in space can hardly be expected by this circumstance to be masters of the total mystery of space. So there is no certainty that we are going to discover a, the solution by interrogating strangers from other worlds. It is possible that we might find some planet out there uh, which has achieved a higher culture than we have known. But then if we just simply wait patiently and behave ourselves, we will achieve the same thing here in due time. It is just that uh, we hope that our destructive instincts will not overwhelm us before our constructive ones can set in and control us. Thus, the problem of fighting our way through this mysterious curtain of the unknown and by the physical pressure of our determination conquering the mystery of space, uh, these prospects are not particularly uh, hopeful. We do not see too much our probability of their immediate fulfillment. So philosophy has created a concept which it has held for a long time, namely that if there is any power by means of which man can become aware of the source of himself or to reach an, a full knowledge of his own potentials, this process must be within him. It must be sustained and supported by natural endowments. It would appear that if man can have the variety of experiences which our encyclopedia describes, it is also possible that this almost limitless faculty, this power which seems to have no restriction upon it, except that of the organism in which it exists, may also possess within its own structure the power to answer the mystery of itself. That actually man's exploration of the universe is very largely made possible only 
by the increasing understanding and use of these faculties which he now possesses. That whereas we may build all kinds of wonderful instruments and, and machines for diverse uh, projects, that man himself possesses an instrument far more wonderful than any that can be devised. There is no instrument that man could ever make that could write the story of human history in terms of action. All of the countless thoughts uh, which have come down to us through the long streams of human effort, these thoughts are of a strangely living and vital nature, and not one of them could have arisen in a machine. Thus, the actual creative process of man is internal. And it is from within himself that must pour into manifestation everything uh, that man can hope to know or hope to discover about truth, about beauty, about friendship, love, and God. These things are internal experiences. So from the time of Neoplatonism on, uh, the concept of a science of sciences an art of arts, a method beyond all methods, by means of which the individual could come to understand the operation of mind in the universe. This was held to be the highest form of learning, the one most wonderful and most necessary. The uh, Neoplatonists and those who followed after them were convinced that the only possible way in which this achievement could be made possible was to liberate mind from the pressures of its own processes and the pressures of heredity and environment. In other words, if the mind is so conditioned by the structure in which it exists or is so limited by the peculiar demands of various persons of different prejudices and conceits that it cannot reveal its own correct and proper nature. Then the problem of man is to create a process by which it can be adequately revealed. The processes of man therefore involve the perfection of the mental life or the, of the over life, which is probably far more than mental or mental meaning far more than we understand, that this is possible only when the individual reduces the false pressures which condition thinking. Plato had much of this thought, and so did Socrates. It meant to primarily that if you want the mind to be honest, you must not load it with things that are dishonest. If you want it to think truly, you must not demand that it think falsely. If you want it to fulfill its own purpose, then we must not bind it hopelessly to our personal and unenlightened purposes. Instead of the mind, therefore, being the servant of our own ambition, we must in a strange way release the mind into freedom. We must give it the right to be itself assuming that if it is a divine instrument, that when it is itself, it achieves its own greatest good and also the greatest good of all creatures that are concerned with life. Now we may say, and we do say, for instance, that we could not do this to a small child. We cannot say to the child, I will place no limitation upon your thinking. Therefore, think as you will and as you please and follow these thoughts. Such a situation would end in pandemonium. We attempted it not too long ago in the miracle of the undisciplined child, but nobody could live with the miracle. It was uh, obvious that you cannot simply remove barriers. The moment the exper experience was attempted, we became aware of a law operating in nature. Namely, that you have to mature or develop a being or a person before it can be entrusted with the administering of its own mind. <coughs> Philosophy, therefore, took the ground, not that you simply follow mind, but first that you remove those parts of yourself 
by which the mind is conditioned against truth. This means that in the case of the small child, its emotions, its faculties, and its powers have to be brought under the law of moderation. It has to gradually attain honesty, for in some mysterious way, honesty is the most important factor in the functioning of the mind. If the mind is conditioned, as most human minds are, not only by the immediate environment of family, but the larger environment of world policy, it is obvious that where ambition appears to be rewarded, the mind will be directed toward ambitious projects. Where scheming has more authority than planning, we will have more schemes than plans. Where selfishness apparently guarantees uh, the survival of our primary material interests, we will be selfish. The mind, therefore, cannot be completely honorable if the society in which it dwells is not honorable, nor can it be relieved from pressures unless these pressures are no longer necessary for its survival. Thus, survival thinking, such as we are most commonly acquainted with, is not the type of thinking which will guarantee us any form of mental honesty. But assuming, as the philosophers of old assumed, that if man could be brought to a state in which he could honestly and honorably trust himself to the working of his own conscious mind or to the subconscious processes behind it. And in the expression of this mind, no pressure or psychotic or neurotic force from himself was used to adulterate or condition mind but that if mind in its fullness, in its universality, could move through him and allowed to fulfill its own purpose in him, rather than being directed to the purposes of his conscious procedures, then it is quite possible that this divine mind moving into operation could solve every problem of human existence. Because actually, the problems of human existence are mostly mental. They arise from the various false thinkings which have dominated human society for thousands of years. Even history is very little more than a record of man's mistakes and how he has blundered his way from one generation to another, misusing his own mind but surviving largely because he exists within a pattern of universal thought which seems to be able to anticipate all his personal mistakes. This type of procedure uh, has been part of the theory that uh, we associate with mysticism. Mysticism, therefore, seems to be the power of the individual uh, to so sublimate his personal conduct that he is capable of experiencing universal purpose. Now, it is not always easy for man to so sublimate, but then it is not easy for man to attain the knowledge of electronics and nuclear physics which he possesses today. The only way in which man learned uh, the mystery of universal physics was to devote great time, great effort, and in the case of a physical science, great wealth, to the achievement of a particular end. Scientists all over the world went to work upon these problems. They united every conceivable resource. They were supported by their governments, and they also uh, developed intensive systems of training so that young men could be brought into this field, the field of nuclear physics, with such an intense background of specialized knowledge that they could carry on from any given point. The problem of working with the consciousness of man has never enjoyed any such support. It has never been a major project worked upon consciously and intentionally uh, by the leaders of our various levels of activity. We have never had uh, the encouragement or the sustaining power for the enlargement of our own character that has been expended on other things. 
As a result of that, the science of man languishes even as the sciences themselves appear to flourish. It is, therefore, also a problem which uh, mystics have contemplated as to whether the means used in science are necessarily applicable to the problem of the solution of the problem of mind. And the general conclusion has been that science did not invent thought. Science did not create Galileo or Copernicus. These minds created science. Uh, the uh, great artists, Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, Botticelli, these men did not invent art. Art moved through them as an instinct or impulse of their own consciousness. Consequently, it would seem to the mystic uh, that all knowledge that is essential and real it comes through man from the maturity of itself in space, that man does not have to create these structures. He does not have to go through the t tedious means that he would employ in building a physical house. It is an entirely different dimension of endeavor. And philosophy has long pointed out uh, that perhaps the greatest key in the world to cosmic consciousness is simply relaxation. Man probably would do pretty well uh, in the direction of things that are right if he would just not do the things that are wrong. If he stopped making mistakes, virtue would remain. Therefore, actually, he has to struggle against value. It is not that he has to create truth. He has to rise above the pressure of error. It is not that he must create a universal structure or devise a universal mind or fill space with the inadequate procedures of his own consciousness. It is merely a matter of being intelligently receptive to value. This also suggests that it is possible to man, for we do not as yet have the mentality by which we could take on the universe and try to run it. Some have optimism in this direction, but up to now it has been rather ineffective. Actually, what we are searching for is something that already exists. We are seeking to find some way of becoming attuned to a situation which is already the answer to our question. The breakthrough, therefore, is not man reaching out and putting the universe in order. The breakthrough is man being able to experience the ever-existing order of the universe. It would seem then that the task is not impossible. Perhaps it is not much different than the possibility of a person long blind regaining his sight, or an individual who has willfully shut his eyes over a long period of time, learning to open them again. Uh, the, the very procedure as found in mysticism both in East and West philosophical systems would seem to indicate that under certain conditions, now generally referred to as a mystical experience, it is quite possible for man to suddenly become aware of a process ever existing. That the individual is equipped with faculties and powers by which he is able to accept the universe. That he is capable of the direct personal experience of the presence of cosmic reality. If this is true, perhaps there is this, what might almost be termed a shortcut, but it is far from short, uh, to the scientific technique. Man can keep on building his transistors till the end of time, but they will not solve this problem. The great problem lies, therefore, in man becoming aware 
through some method of his own, of those values which are immediately available to him, being no further from him than the boundaries which he himself sets up. Uh, philosophy, religion, mysticism, even psychology are of a mother, rather common mind then that tensions, pressures, and artificialities are the reasons why man is badly oriented. That it is his own stubborn determination to perpetuate his own mistakes uh, that actually prevents him from discovering the remedial processes in the universe. To meet this emergency, various systems have been devised, all of which point out man's need for greater understanding and would set forth some means of attaining it. Uh, there are many elaborate formulas, strange symbolisms and deep rites and ceremonies for these purposes. But most of these procedures are themselves emblematic of something else. For all these procedures are merely means of achieving a single end, the repointing of man's attitude from one of personal aggressiveness to a more personal acceptance of that which is available. The proper attitude, according to some of the Greeks, of, for man toward universal reality or universal mind would be the same as his attitude toward the light of the sun. We rise in the morning, we expect the sun. We have never conceived in recent times at least that the sun was dependent upon us. We have never been able to work up much enthusiasm as to whether the sun was republican or democratic nor have we been very much moved as to whether it belonged to our religion or somebody else's. It seems that it shines upon the just and the unjust. The same is true of rain. It falls upon the believer and the unbeliever. Our, our natural opponent, whom we would wish to the lowest degrees of perdition, may be getting the best rainfall. <laughs> And uh, the individual who feels himself overwhelmed by piety uh, may find his land as dry as Southern California. This situation seems to imply that these universal things have a universal acceptance. We all have become so accustomed to dependency upon the light of the sun uh, that we build our whole concept of life around it. We do not question it. We accept it. And if it is in some cases a little inconvenient that it does not rise at some other hour or at some other place, we have recognized this inconvenience as inevitable and have compensated by artificial illumination. This, then, is to many people the key to our relationship with universal mind that we become able to accept it, that we assume it, that we regard it for what it is, and become distinctly aware that it is available to all of us. Also, mysticism and those who have gone far in these matters point out that as man relaxes his own thinking and rele releases his own pressures, reducing the personal equation in relation to the impersonal life within him. As he achieves this, mind moves into uniformity. The person who is not opinionated seems to enjoy a kind of mental association with other persons also not opinionated. Thus, as the human equation um, is reduced, the personal aspects of mentation are likewise reduced. Whereas the very selfish and very personal uh, individual is completely isolated by his own attitudes, if he becomes less personal and less dogmatic, 
This is immediately noticeable as a change in his own attitude. To the degree, therefore, that mind can begin to come through him in its own nature, this person becomes like all things that are good and beautiful. If his thoughts are true, his thoughts correspond with the thoughts of all who are true. Thus it becomes possible to assume that mind is not only existing in infinite manifestation, but that this infinite diversity is actually depended from a unity, and that the diversity is due to ignorance. That the different types of thoughts that we think are reconcilable and can be brought to a common acceptance if these thoughts are honest, if they are real and honorable, and if they arise uh, from the direct participation of universal mind in the affairs of man. Consequently, it has seemed and pretty much been demonstrated that it is possible that cosmic mind or divine mind is one mind with one great conscious purpose, with one inevitable reality moving through itself, and that this diversity which we experience is only the result of one mind operating through innumerable bodies or instruments and taking on certain isolation or separateness because of its imprisonment in these arbitrary forms and arbitrary mental processes. Thus, uh, the idea that mind contradicts mind is overcome by the experience of mental unfoldment. Mind specializes. That is true. Mind identifies and intensifies. But mind, if it is of one quality, will not conflict. Also, if universal mind is one mind, its own processes cannot conflict with themselves or each other. And mostly philosophy has pointed out that there is evidence that mind is not merely a private thinking equipment intended merely to us to em us enable us to perpetuate our own notions that mind itself is not responsible for the fact that we cannot get along together. Mind does not the reason why we have East and West psychologically. Mind is not the reason why nations cannot agree. Mind actually is not the cause of separation or separateness. It is mind's energies misused by prejudiced beings that results in all this trouble. If therefore man can eliminate prejudice or reduce it, if he can remove ulterior motives from the inducements to mentation, if he can quietly and honorably accept mind, he will discover, perhaps, that it exists in various levels of manifestation, but that all these levels are essentially right. We may say that a primitive being, a primitive person, untrained in various lines of specialized thought, uneducated and unconditioned by the advancements of society, might not think the same way. Uh, as a highly developed scholar. But even the simplest of thoughts have their own peculiar integrities. And among primitive peoples, anthropologists have realized that there is a dynamic, simple honesty. That this honesty is one of the evidences of a common mind principle. And all peoples, from the most simple to the most sophisticated, have certain very simple common ideas together. But in the sophisticated, these common ideas are submerged. 
beneath a pattern of interpretation and misinterpretation by which their validity is largely lost. I think then that we can assume in terms of philosophy uh, that the mental phenomena of existence bears witness to one unconditioned or unrestricted mental fact, principle, energy, or power that takes on its various attributes and aspects as a result of involvement in the material elements of existence. That as we may say with the Chinese, that water is of no shape yet of all shapes. And if placed in a square vessel is square, and if in a round vessel is round. So we may say that mine, placed in a round vessel, may become a Republican. In a square vessel may become a Democrat. Yet the mind itself gains its shape only from its container and not from its own substance. Thus a mind born into a family of ten generations of Republicans has a certain, shall we say, uh, prejudice or a certain pressure toward becoming a member of that party. Also another mind born somewhere in the solid south may come from generations of steadfast Democrats. These things, however, these incidents may determine the use of mind, but not the substance of it. And that to the degree an individual can overcome these pressures of tradition and heredity, to, those, to that degree the individual can become a free thinker in space, making use of mental energy for essentially its own purposes. Now, what is the purpose of mind as far as we are able to understand the mental energy? What is the final use that it is conceivable that a man can make of mind? Well, most people would not say that the most final use for them is that they would put their own lives in order so that they would no longer suffer or make mistakes. Well, perhaps the truth is only an extension of this uh, concept. We must assume that the principle of mind exists in order that the natural ends of thought may be possible. Now what are the natural ends of thought? Probably the most important is the contemplation of reality. The power to know that which is eternally and inevitably true. Therefore, perhaps in simple terms, we can say that the end of mind is that man shall know the truth. That this truth, therefore, may be one of many things. There are levels of truth, but in the proper growth of man, these levels do not conflict. They are merely like the rungs of a ladder or the steps of a staircase. Each one ascends naturally to that which is superior to itself, unless it is deformed by false opinion. Knowing or believing that the proper and happy state of man is that he shall live with his kind in peace, that he shall use all knowledge for the improvement of life and for the service of universal purpose. Recognizing also, as the devout did long ago, that from the use of our own faculties we can become more and more aware of the divine principle at the source of life, so that we can assume that the ultimate purpose of mind is either our union with the eternal or our contemplation of that and our continuous rapturous realization of the magnificent plan and purpose, and through mind also to become aware of the workings of that plan, so that we may establish right conduct, right conduct being in this case obedience to the plan of life itself. These grand ends, therefore, 
being natural within the structure of thought, man being able to conceive them by the very mind with which he hopes to attain them. We may therefore assume that the end of all thinking is that man shall know, that he shall know the truth, and the truth shall make him free. If this be the end, all that contributes toward this end is essentially good. That which detracts from it is not so good. And always in the beginning, uh, the struggle lies between what one group calls mortal mind and divine mind. Bami termed this uh, the will of heaven and self-will. Between every individual and his acceptance of truth, is his own self-will, his own determination to do as he pleases, or perhaps his negative inability to prevent himself from doing what he pleases. As long as each individual, therefore, thinks only of himself and of his own projects, he takes this mind which he has and makes an intensely personal instrument out of it. It becomes his servant. It becomes the instrument of his purpose. Bemi, the German mystic, pointed out that man cannot serve two masters. He cannot bo serve both heaven and his own selfishness. The uh, service of selfishness, we know. We have the history of it. It is disaster. There's never been an example yet where selfishness achieved a universal good. Yet in spite of this part of history, which we seldom contemplate, selfishness is still our dominant emotion. And against this emotion, there has to be arrayed something stronger than itself. This difference, then, is that whereas skill is necessary to advance science, what we might term ethics is necessary to advance man's mind toward unity with truth. If we can then, to even a slight degree, begin to reduce pressure, we then become more and more aware of the natural luminousness of living. It is as though we took a cloth and cleaned a darkened glass so that the light can shine through. We cannot create the light. We cannot increase the light. We cannot decrease it nor can we bestow upon it any color not natural to itself. But we can direct and regulate the release of this life or light in ourselves. And it is our acceptance and regulation of this divine power that determines our own rational condition, whether we are reasonable or unreasonable creatures, whether we are advancing the cause of destiny or impairing or inhibiting the growth of those around us. So in mysticism, the concept of permitting the light to shine, to prevent this light from being hidden under a bushel, as in the story and the parable, that if we have a light, we will place this light in a high place, that it may give light. But if we are foolish people, we may hide this light in an attempt to keep it for ourselves. This is just a term of, for selfishness, one of the most common benight, benighting forces in the universe. Selfishness is not merely uh, the holding on to what we have. It is holding on to our own thoughts that are not adequate. So many persons who are, self, uh, are unselfish of what they have remain intensely selfish of what they are. And in the holding of their opinion or attitude, are more dangerously selfish than if they held on to their goods and were less charitable. Incidentally, the search then for this participation in cosmic mind or divine mind is regulated by an overconcept. Our own mind, even in its present level of function, is able to conceive by abstract thought certain probabilities. When these are rationalized, they become reason. And reason is as exact as science, if it is exactly used. By reason, we come to know. 
that as the mind has unfolded for millions of years, it will continue to unfold. Therefore, at this time, man is perhaps immediately capable of controlling this unfoldment. Whereas in the past, man has been more or less uh, merely an instrument of opinions and has followed his own pressures and has thereby prevented the natural progress of the mind, he may now be able uh, to so control his own conduct in terms of mental need that he will be able to permit the mind to move in through him. Now, if this mind was merely another mechanical principle of himself, the victory of mind over matter would mean nothing. But if by mind we now mean cosmic wisdom, we are now referring directly to an attribute of the divine. In some modern systems of metaphysics, uh, divine mind is a synonym of God. It represents not intellect as we commonly think it, the weighing, balancing, estimating processes of comparative mentation. By mind we now mean God's consciousness at work in the world. By mind, therefore, we imply the total pattern of reality, the self-conscious picture of things. We recognize the archetypal dimension of the eternal will operating eternally according to its own purpose. If then, by opening ourselves to universal mind, we are opening ourselves to thinking with God, <coughs> the process is most justifiable and important. If we are only thinking of unfolding the mind so that it can continue to run its own private destinies, then we have achieved nothing. But uh, many Eastern systems also, as Zen and Yoga, point out that when man becomes uh, disciplined, when he relaxes away from the pressures of his own intellect, he becomes a participant in one mind. That this one mind is everywhere the same, because it is the mind of God. That this mind everywhere thinks true, because truth is the natural attribute of God. And that by this mind, man is capable not only of thinking about, but thinking with. That true cosmic mind is an experience of actually being one with the universal process of thought. It is the only escape man has from the limitation of the fact that he can never think of being anything but himself. He can never escape into anyone else's thought. He can never really share the mental experience of another creature. He can only by symbolism, by word, have this communicated to him. But he can never experience the life of another individual. If he could, most of the intolerances of man would have ceased long ago. But because we can only hear about other things and experience only ourselves, we have isolated from direct contact with all other living creatures. The mystical experience of mental identity is therefore not merely a contemplation of the works of the divine mind, but a participation in them a total experience of them, so that our own personal mind becomes for that moment universalized, so that it extends into every atom of space and into the most remote vistas of time and condition, that in that moment we are life itself. We are the impulse behind all uh, living process. We experience directly the pattern of universal purpose. We become also instinctively aware that this pattern is inevitable, that it is sufficient, that in it there is no weakness, flaw, or limitation, and therefore that this pattern can be trusted completely, that to trust ourselves to it is to trust ourselves to the only certainty that exists in space. 
In that moment, therefore, we become devout in the truest and most important sense of that word. We are not only aware of God, but we accept God as the sovereignty of the real over every other condition that may seem to exist. As uh, Avalok Ellis points out, therefore, this experience is the end of all doubting. It is the end of all wondering, questioning. It is the end of all ability to uh, dispute uh, the essential values of existence. In this moment, the total unity of mind, the total unity of life, the unity of God, the unity of law, the unity of creation, all these things are inwardly experienced, apperceived by a faculty which we do possess, whether we develop it or not. Thus the long path of mind and mind striving for value uh, seems to lead to this one essential uh, situation, that the individual who is able by his own efforts and by his own integrities to gradually reduce the false pressures uh, that affect his mind may in time be able to use the mental instrument for its essential purpose, the discovery of reality, the personal and immediate experience of the presence of God in all things. That once this is actually experienced, all other situations become entirely secondary. Once this is experienced, the experience is unforgettable. It must be the dominant factor in life, and has been so in numbers of cases where human beings have had the uh, opportunity to sense inwardly the full impact of the cosmic plan. Thus, cosmic mind moving into our lives moves through uh, the ability which we possess to detach our consciousness from ulterior motive. If instead of demanding that the mind demonstrate that which we wish to demonstrate, we can achieve a certain measure of this quality of being receptive to truth, desiring truth above all other things, whether it uh, uh, supports our opinions or overwhelms them is not important. If above all of our own purposes and our own attitudes, we have a real and eternal devotion to principle, so that we are willing to be corrected by mind rather than force mind to serve our mistakes, we gradually develop this internal attitude, I think we will discover that the faculties of the mind begin to clarify. And we come in the end to the recognition that the mind is the teacher that has been given to each of us in order that we might learn the great lesson of life. And that if we are able to accept this mental power, adapting it only to such good as we know, and when in doubt, permitting ourselves to relax into the experience of the natural energy of mental uh, process, we will probably realize that truly God in substance and essence manifests through the divine thought, and that this divine thought is forever thoughtful of creation and that the divine mind in motion, in action, is truly a very present help in time of trouble. It is the presence of God in the peculiar mechanism of our own psychic structure. It is the one on final authority. It is the apex of our personalities and our temperaments and our dispositions. It is, of course, not only all this, but it is the mysterious substance from which the integration of our own beings originated. If, therefore, as persons we exist, it is because we are minds. 
And it is our wonderful privilege to go so far as to even to sacrifice the personal existence of ourselves for the restoration of the divine process in us. Through the quietude, through the simple, natural uh, of admiration for the good, uh, through the gradual relaxing away of pressures which have, in, have made us mentally intemperate, we can gradually come to experience the presence of a universal thought process in ourselves which confers peace and understanding and tranquility and further directs us along the way that we must go if we are to come finally to the immediate experience of reality as God. In these processes, uh, the, the subject of cosmic mind is becoming more and more interesting uh, to many scientific minds as well as to those of more devotional interests and inclinations. Time's up.